as if we didn't need to see it again. We know this, that when Labour run things, they run them badly. Londoners are starting to see through it, and we have a brilliant candidate in Susan Hall who will, on the 2nd of May, prove to Sadiq Khan that actually Sadiq can't. <laughs> and we will, and I don't think I'm breaking any state secrets here, also have a general election. Now, this is likely to be a general election where the Conservatives enter as the underdogs. And I know in recent years, you will have had difficult conversations with voters. I certainly have. But I would say just three things about those conversations. First, every single conversation I have had on the doorstep has been improved by the mention of Rishi Sunak and the job that he does as our Prime Minister. Second, that there is no enthusiasm for Sakir Starmer and even less trust in him. And third, that wherever Labour runs something in the country, they run it badly. Let me tell you first about our great Prime Minister. The message coming across loud and clear from the doorstep is that people can see we're moving in the right direction, that the Conservatives are getting on with the job and that Rishi Sunak is the right man to steer this country through extremely challenging times. People understand also the tough choices and the trade-offs that true leadership entails. They look at our Prime Minister and see someone who is prepared to make the tough, long-term decisions to get the country on the right path for our future. Someone who is not afraid to challenge the old-style Westminster politics of short-termism that we have seen so much of in the past. That earns respect. It wins trust, and it will be by continuing to win that trust and respect that we will also win nationally next year. Which takes me to my second point, that there is no liking for Sakia Starmer and definitely no trust. Who is the real Sakia Starmer? The friend and supporter of Jeremy Corbyn? The puppet of Tony Blair? or the mouthpiece of Just Stop Oil. All we do know is that he has broken every single leadership pledge and flip-flopped almost 60 times in just three years. This is a man who will literally say anything that suits him at that time. I've always thought that the best leaders wake up each morning and ask themselves, what am I going to do today? Some leaders ask themselves, what am I going to say today? Sakir wakes up and asks himself, what am I going to believe today? And ladies and gentlemen, can I just let you into also a little bit of a secret? These are available. Anybody who likes uh, this association of Sakir Starmer with flip flops, I have these available at the Conservative shop outside for just £16.99, also online at conservatives.com, your own pair of Sakia Starmer flip-flops. I warmly recommend them to you. But not once has there been any clear plan for Britain from Sakia. He is not honest with people about the challenges that the country faces. He has no new ideas, criticizes from the sidelines, calling for yet more money to be magicked up. Now, here's another thing we know that wherever Labour runs something, they run it badly. I've already mentioned London. Look at Wales. We're going to hear from Andrew R.T. Davies later this afternoon and David T.C. Davies, the Secretary of State for Wales. Patients almost twice as likely to be on the NHS waiting list as they are in England. But according to Sakia, Labour in Wales is, quote, a blueprint for what they would do in Westminster. Now, that's not a blueprint, ladies and gentlemen. It is a red flag, and it's bringing Wales to a standstill. Look at Labour-run Birmingham City Council. Its leader hand-picked by Sakia and his union paymasters to sort out the finances, praised by Sakia just a few months ago. So what did they do? They voted unanimously to bump up their own pay packets, blow millions of pounds on consultants, all paid for by hiking council tax for hard-working local people by the maximum amount. This is Europe's largest local authority. Before being hit by a £760 million legal bill for, and here is the irony, 
equal pay claims. £760 million for one local authority. A Labour Council that spent more time thinking up, you might remember this, from the height of the pandemic, more time thinking up new woke street names than looking after their own finances. Birmingham City Council really did have a diversity growth. They had an Inspire Alley. And now, ladies and gentlemen, they are up Bankruptcy Avenue. From what we do know of Labour's plans for the UK, the entire country would go the same way. Labour's plan for energy, lovingly crafted by Just Stop Oil, would leave us gasping for energy imports from unfriendly foreign powers. Their plan for immigration would see the numbers coming, coming into this country decided not by us, but by Brussels. And their plan for the economy has already signed the UK up to £90 billion of uncosted funding commitments. Before putting money on the credit card, didn't work out so well for them last time. Now, you can probably work out where this is going. Dear Chief Secretary, no money left. And that reminder, ladies and gentlemen, should tell us that we need to work to stop Labour getting back in. We cannot let them do to the UK what they have done to Wales, what they have done to London, and what they have done to Birmingham. There is a surefire way to stop them in their tracks. It's through effective campaigning, ladies and gentlemen, and winning next year at all levels. Now, let me tell you something about somebody who did know a thing or two about campaigning. A much-loved member of our Conservative family who represented his constituents with the utmost dedication. Sir David Amos, Member of Parliament first for Basildon and then for South End West. Many of us will remember his campaigns on issues, including the honouring of Raoul Wallenberg for his amazing humanitarian works in World War II, support for those suffering from endometriosis, and of course the awarding of city status to his beloved South End on Sea. And many of us remember well, I'll never forget the day, the deeply shocking circumstances of his murder in the course of his duty. So today, in his memory, I am proud to announce the launching of the Sir David Amis Fund to support more dedicated local campaigning. The Sir David Amis Fund will be available to all of our members of Parliament to apply for. The fund will be focused on supporting local campaigns which transcend party politics, such as campaigning to secure city status for their town. There will be two successful applicants each year, with funding made available to support them campaign on and better promote their local cause. And I'm delighted to confirm that Anna Firth MP, Sir David's successor in South End West, who's watching this now uh, from the train on her way up to Manchester, will work with me to pick those successful applicants. So today I make one other announcement to help get local campaigns up and running. As chairman, I know the value of being well organised locally and the importance of CCHQ having a strong network of campaign managers has in helping making that happen. And that is why, since the start of this year, we have more than doubled the number of campaign, campaign managers that CCHQ employs. And for the first time ever, we have started to hire digital campaign managers as well. They are helping to build our social media presence, collecting more emails, and filming engaging local content. We saw just how important our digital campaign managers were in Uxbridge, where we campaign relentlessly on social media and email against the ULES. And conference, I want to ensure you know we will be expanding the number of campaign managers we have in advance of the general election to support you on the ground. Whilst we'll be growing the number in the period up to the next general election, I've also challenged my colleagues in CCHQ to find sensible and creative solutions for the long term to ensure that the feast and famine of campaign managers we've seen in recent years ends. So I want to assure that we are forward-looking and growing a sustainable, well-trained and experienced campaigning organisation. Conference, I will leave you with one final thought. As we go out and campaign, as we make our arguments, we shouldn't be apologetic 
about what a Conservative government led by Rishi Sunak means. It means strong and decisive long-term action on the things that matter most to people. Action that the country needs to put us on the best footing for the future. Now, when I look back at the achievements of this country under the Conservatives, I take great pride. I've been a minister in this government almost continually for 12 years. Pride that, back in 2010, we made the tough choices to get the country's finances back under control. That has made us more able to withstand the headwinds that have come our way since. Pride that we kept our great union together in 2014. And thank you, Nicola, for your help in cementing that this year as well. Pride that when the British people asked us to deliver on the result of the EU referendum, we kept true to our word and we got it done. Pride that we used those new freedoms to deliver a world-leading vaccination program and to help beat back coronavirus and provide the financial support that British families and businesses needed. And pride that just a year and a half ago, it was the UK that stood tall and galvanized the rest of the world in support of Ukraine. So ladies and gentlemen, conference, the United Kingdom is a great country. It faces profound and complex challenges like the whole of the Western world. But our best days in Britain are still to come. The country is best served by strong, decisive leadership that is focused on delivering a brighter future for everyone, the leadership of our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and this great Conservative Party. And by working together as a great Conservative family, we can ensure victory in 2024, economic renewal, and a stronger and happier United Kingdom. Thank you very much indeed, and welcome to conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton-Harris. Hello, conference, and um, welcome. For the last 391 days, I've had the best job in government, being Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. In that time, I've travelled the length and breadth of Northern Ireland, and it's been truly an honour to see and meet so many amazing people, social enterprises, businesses and voluntary organisations. I've been to places like Harland and Wolfe, the world leaders in shipbuilding, where thanks to a Ministry of Defence contract, shipbuilding is returning to Belfast. Places like the Game of Thrones studios, the TV series that has generated huge amounts of money for the Northern Ireland economy. And places like Hinch Distillery, the home of Northern Ireland, some of Northern Ireland's finest whiskey and gin. As my spads will know, that was a really tough visit. Northern Ireland has so much to offer, not just to the 1.9 million people that live there or the 5 million tourists who visit every year, but to us all as an integral part of the United Kingdom. This was demonstrated to me yesterday down the road in Lee, where I had an excellent a visit with our MP there, the brilliant James Grundy, to a company called O'Neill's, a sportswear company with a factory in Northern Ireland and a design centre in Lee that employs 40 people. You'll no doubt have seen their name emblazoned on rugby and football kits of teams across the United Kingdom, including the brilliant Lee Rugby Union Football Club, who I also met yesterday. O'Neill's is just one example of how Northern Ireland contributes to our economy and the union. And I'm proud it's my job to represent Northern Ireland, and I'm proud it's the job of my great ministerial team too. And I have superb support from Steve Baker and Lord Kane, and um, our amazing PPS Tom Hunt, our brilliant whips Rob Largan, Lord Courtdown, and Lord Mott. And it's our job to bang the drum for that small, bustling, proud part of our country, and that's what we do day in and day out, and I thank you all for it. Conference. I don't need to remind you that we are the Conservative and Unionist Party. This party and this government will never shy away from our support for the Union. Northern Ireland is stronger for it, its future is strengthened by it, and the United Kingdom is and will be greater for it. I didn't mention Harland and Wharf earlier by accident. No, those 900 jobs are being created by the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defence for ships that will protect the United Kingdom, a contract that is an obvious and direct benefit of our union. 
And let's not forget, it wasn't too long ago that Sir Keir Starmer loyally served under a Labour leader who wanted to break up our precious union. You heard Greg say, but under, uh, under Starmer, Labour flipped from saying they campaigned for the union in a border poll to bravely failing to pick a side. But now we know all too well that Starmer's positions on all sorts of policies change more than a weather vane. It's only our party that will relentlessly advocate for the union because we know just how important Northern Ireland is to it. When I started in the role of Secretary of State, many in Northern Ireland were unbelievably frustrated with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Agreed with the best of intentions, its flaws became quickly apparent. Too many businesses based in Great Britain, unsure of the regulatory environment they found themselves in, decided to pull back from servicing consumers in Northern Ireland. There are problems that affected everyday lives regarding the movement of pets, plants and parcels, and with even medicine supplies coming under threat. The Prime Minister recognised this too and sought to change it, focusing on the practical concerns that had been raised and always, always keeping the protection of the Union as his priority. And so we agreed the Windsor framework. After months of negotiations, we reached the deal with the European Union that removes trade barriers, allows goods available on shelves in Great Britain to move freely into Northern Ireland, ensures Northern Ireland benefits from the same VAT and alcohol taxes as the rest of the United Kingdom, safeguards Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom internal market through agreements on medicine and state aid, and protects the economic rights of the people of Northern Ireland and provides a basis for us to move forward as one united country. Now I know concerns remain in Northern Ireland about the Windsor Framework, and we will continue to address them. There is scope to do so, based on the principle that the United Kingdom internal market must be promoted as well as protected. But let us also remind ourselves of the fundamental truth. The vast majority of Northern Ireland's economic life is dependent on its connection with the rest of the United Kingdom, and that reality will not change. It's time to get on with business. So today, conference, I can tell you that the first stage of implementing the Windsor Framework Agreement has commenced, removing barriers that existed for Great, British, uh, Great Britain-based businesses to trade with Northern Ireland. This morning, bright and early, I visited Peelport in Birkenhead to see the smooth flow of trade and goods um, available to travel, able to travel between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I'm now actually also actively exploring how we can support a new ferry route between Larne and Liverpool so we can seize the moment to increase trade within the UK even further. And let me just give you one stat to demonstrate how the Windsor framework is a major improvement on the protocol and how it will be noticed by the people of Northern Ireland itself. Over 1,600 new businesses have signed up to our new internal market scheme, meaning more traders than ever want to do business in Northern Ireland. And conference, I just want to say something about the future of Northern Ireland. There's always been a lot of doom and gloom around this subject for too long. In reality, Northern Ireland's economic prospects are unbelievably promising. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I, alongside the Secretary of State for Business and Trade, Kemi, uh, hosted an investment summit in Northern Ireland. 160 international businesses came along, some visiting Northern Ireland for the first time. They came because business truly recognises the opportunities that exist. Nothing could be more important to the strength of the union than a thriving local economy underpinned by political stability. And it's this government that takes, as you know, the long-term decisions in the national interest. If Labour were in charge, we would have a very dis uh, different situation. Um, remember, you know, Keir Starmer, he backed Remain. Then he accepted, well, he said he accepted Brexit. But as shadow Brexit secretary, he worked to block Brexit 48 times. He and his newly appointed shadow Northern Ireland secretary called for a second referendum. In May, Starmer said Britain's future is outside the European Union. But only two weeks ago, he said he didn't want to diverge from EU rules. That's more flip-flops than you'd see on a beach in Mallorca. And you, obviously, you can buy some of those outside as well. Short-term Starmer only offers endless instability, which would not just weaken the Brexit dividends we're seeing, 
but also take a sledgehammer to our union. Conference, for 605 days, there has been no functioning devolved government in Northern Ireland. That means the people of Northern Ireland have been without a government, no new policies developed, no ministers taking decisions on the issues that matter to voters. Since starting this job, I've been working to get politicians back to Stormont because I believe the people of Northern Ireland are best served by the MLAs they elected to take decisions for them. People in Northern Ireland need their locally elected politicians to take action, to make Northern Ireland's uh, finances more sustainable, to improve health, the health service there, where 22% of the population are on a waiting list. And there is, I'm afraid, a very long list of other things that need to be sorted. So I say to my friends in the unionist community, we will continue working to answer your remaining concerns. You know and we know that progress has been made and we are working in a constructive spirit. And it is clear that the vast majority of people and their political leaders want to get this done. Conference, it is the 25th anniversary year of the signing of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Since then, Northern Ireland has come a tremendously long way. But for those 25 years, victims, families, survivors, have been left, some of them have been left without answers about what happened during the 30 years of the Troubles. This Conservative government recently passed the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Act. And whilst it delivers on a manifesto commitment we made to our veterans, it's also of genuine help to all of those affected by the Troubles. It sets up a body that aims to provide answers and accountability to those who want it and is open to all victims of the Troubles. Conference, if I may, I'd very much like to thank Lord Kane here sitting at the front uh, for steering this piece of legislation through. It's massively changed over the course of the last year and it needed all of his immense skill and diplomacy um, throughout that time to get it over the line. So thank you, Jonathan, indeed. <laughs> Keir Starmer wants to repeal this act altogether, but offers absolutely no alternative. Labour have flip-flopped on this issue going back to the days of Tony Blair and Peter Hayne. And yet again, it is a Conservative government that's made a hard but long-term decision to solve a problem that had been left unaddressed by Labour and would be undone by Starmer. So, Conference, Northern Ireland has come a long way, and I know it can go even further. It's thriving as a centre of creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship. Those 160 investors from across the globe who descended on Northern Ireland last month for our investment summit did so because they know Northern Ireland has a bright future. A bright future that's brighter as being part of the United Kingdom. With its troubled past behind it, with its executive back up and running, the opportunities available for the people of Northern Ireland are endless. And the union of the United Kingdom will be strengthened for decades to come. And this Conservative and Unionist Party and this Conservative government will do all it can to help Northern Ireland on its journey to a brighter, prosperous future as an integral part of our United Kingdom. Conference, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andrew R.T. Davis, leader of the Welsh Conservative Party in the Welsh Senate. Well, good afternoon, conference. And this is the moment where you don't want to say he should have gone to Specsavers, looking at the autocue screen so far away from this lectern, to say the least. But it's also the anniversary of the week ago when we put 40 points on Australia. So Eddie Jones isn't quite the know-it-all after all, is he, when you think of his comments he's made about Wales? We showed them on the pitch last Sunday, and we'll continue to do that at the World Cup as the weeks unfold. Conference, it's a huge pleasure to be here in Manchester and to see you all again. And I want to start by saying a big thank you. A big thank you to you, the party members, who put the graft and deliver the message across the whole of Wales. A big thank you to our team of Welsh MPs, led by our brilliant Secretary of State, David T.C. Davis. And a big... And a big thank you to our Senate members, who work tirelessly every day, holding Mark Drakeford and Labour to account. 
A big thank you to our Prime Minister, who has shown leadership and stamina in the face of some of the biggest challenges this country has had to face. Taking the tough decisions is never easy, but that's exactly what Rishi is doing, taking the long-term decisions for a brighter future. As a party, we all want to protect our environment and reduce emissions, but we must do it in a way that doesn't hit working families in the pocket. Rishi's common sense approach will achieve that. The contrast with the Welsh Government, the only part of the UK where Labour are in government, couldn't be more stark. Rather than take a common sense approach, they're motivated by extreme ideology. In the past month, they've introduced a blanket 20 mph speed limit across the whole of Wales. Labour's own figures show that this will cost the economy £9 billion. The cost of changing the signs alone is up to £40 million. And nearly half a million people have signed a petition calling for Labour's blanket 20 mph speed limits to be scrapped. But Mark Drakeford won't listen. And the Labour minister who imposed the blanket 20 mph speed limits on Wales arrogantly dismisses the decent Welsh people who signed the petition as anti-safety. What's worse? Blanket 20 mph speed limits isn't the only extreme policy Labour have imposed on Wales. They've also banned all major new road building projects. And that's not all. Our Prime Minister has introduced tough measures to secure our borders through our Illegal Migration Act. But in Wales, Labour want to pay illegal migrants £1,600 a month. And Labour's other big priority in Wales spending £120 million on 36 more politicians. This is extreme ideology from Labour and it has imposed dangerous measures onto the Welsh people. It is also a distraction from the things that matter. Let us take our Welsh NHS, which has been run by Labour for the past 24 years. Waiting lists are far longer than in England. Ambulance response times are slower and cancer outcomes are worse. And unlike in England, where the Conservatives have protected the health budget, Mark Drakeford and Labour voted to cut our Welsh NHS. And just a fortnight ago, Welsh Conservatives once again voted to protect our Welsh NHS from the cuts that Labour want to impose, supported by the Nationalists. Their priority isn't the Welsh NHS. It's spending £40 million on Blanket 20 MPH and £120 million on 36 more politicians. They're out of touch, and their extreme ideology is also hurting our Welsh economy. Their balmy road-building ban has deterred investment, and their toxic tourism tax has hit key Welsh in, a key Welsh industry. But there's one thing we must not forget, and this matters to everyone across the United Kingdom. Keir Starmer has described Mark Drakeford's Wales as his blueprint for the whole of the UK. That's right. Starmer will deliver longer NHS waiting lists, he'll deliver open borders, and he'll wage war on the motorists. Drakeford has cozied up to the Welsh nationalists who prop up his administration, and Starmer would do exactly the same with the SNP. That's what's at stake at the next general election, and why, as Conservatives, it's our duty to win. So we leave Manchester, we must roll up our sleeves and get on the campaign trail and hammer this home. I'm as proud a Welshman as they come, and it pains me to see what Labour have done to Wales. And I don't want to see that happening across the rest of the United Kingdom. So together, let's stop that happening. Let's take the fight to Labour. Together, we are taking the long-term decisions for a brighter future, and we're delivering for our great country. Thank you, Conference. It's now my great pleasure to introduce a good friend, colleague and staunch Conservative, the passionate, the dedicated Secretary of State for Wales and Member for Monmouthshire, David T.C. Davis. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to be introduced by Andrew R. T. Davis, who, as you can see, is so energetically holding the Labour government to account in Wales.
And we're also joined today by many of our wonderful Senate members, by our Welsh members of Parliament, by, of course, our councillors, uh, by uh, my predecessor, uh, Peter Fox, who, uh, rather, um, who, who's now the Assembly member, the Senate member for uh, Monmouth, uh, all of our activists, and, of course, uh, many, many others from Wales. It's always a mistake, actually, to single anyone out, as I just did, but I do want to pay a quick tribute to one of my predecessors, Simon Hart, who did a fantastic job as a Secretary of State for Wales and is now serving as our Chief Whip and doing a very good job at that as well. I, I do mean that, by the way, but it is always a good idea to say nice things about the Chief Whip at all times in my job. But how wonderful it is to be in Manchester, to feel already the enthusiasm and the energy to get out on the doorsteps and to win the next general election. And here in Wales, we do have a special role to play in winning that historic fifth term. Because in Wales, we have suffered for over two decades with an incompetent Labour government, which, as Andrew has just pointed out, Sir Keir Starmer sees as his blueprint that he wants to roll out across the rest of the United Kingdom. Let me just remind you again, ladies and gentlemen, of some of the failures that we have had to endure in Wales. We have had over 20 years of failure to deliver high standards in the National Health Service, where 27,000 people have been stuck on a Welsh NHS waiting list for over two years. According to Keir Starmer, this is a blueprint that he will roll out for the health service across the rest of the United Kingdom. We've had over 20 years of failure in schools which has led to Welsh pupils receiving the lowest scores in the United Kingdom for reading, for writing, and for maths. And once again, Labour described this as a blueprint for the rest of the United Kingdom. And just as we've seen in London, so we see in Wales, Labour is failing hard-pressed drivers and continuing to wage its war against motorists. As Andrew reminded us, We've been hit with draconian 20 mile an hour speed limits, costing £33 million just to put the signs in place, but it's going to cost many, many billions of pounds in terms of the hit to our economy. Half a million people have signed a petition against the move, more than actually voted for Labour at the last Senate elections in Wales, but they bury their heads in the sand and ignore the mounting criticism. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that Labour ministers in Wales like to have chummy meetings with Extinction Rebellion? Can it be a surprise to any of us that they have decided that one of their flagship policies is to cancel all road building projects? That's right. No new roads will ever be built again in Wales. So we sit there in ever increasing traffic jams, breathing in fumes, and Labour ministers, who do like to fly around the world a bit, by the way, tell us that all of this is going to combat climate change. Frankly, it feels to me as though our Welsh Labour government will not be happy unless we're moving around Wales by horse and cart. But instead of taking the action to make sure that children are educated, that patients are treated, that commuters can drive to work, what do we get? Well, we got plans from Welsh Labour for a ridiculous nanny state ban on meal deals as we know them. We also have a Labour-run Welsh Government which has set out proposals to spend over £100 million creating dozens of extra politicians within the Senate. And within seven days of announcing this, they were telling the NHS to cut its services. It gets worse. While our Government has a plan, while our Home Secretary fights in the courts to ensure that we can remove people who come illegally into this country, into a safe third country, Labour's proposal is to hand out £1,600 a month to many asylum seekers in Wales, and then on top of that, to demand that they be exempt from having to contribute towards their own legal bills. It's all part of Labour's blueprint for the United Kingdom. We say that to ease mountain congestion on the roads, we must see more roads built. We need the construction of an M4 relief road, and we need upgrades to North Wales roads, including the A55. We call on Labour to end its absurd 20 mile an hour blanket speed limit on Welsh roads, which its own analysis has warned will hit the economy by more than £4 billion. And it's absolutely vital that confidence in Welsh health boards is restored, which is why we call today on the Welsh Labour government 
to launch an independent inquiry to uncover the many drastic failures into the Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board. And with 27,000 people currently stuck on a waiting list for more than two years, Labour need to focus more of their resources on tackling this backlog. Before anyone says to you, ladies and gentlemen, that perhaps they say that they don't have enough money, let's just remind ourselves of one thing. The Welsh Labour Government are currently receiving the largest funding settlement from the UK Government in the history of devolution, thanks to our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. We are providing a record £18 billion a year, which is still increasing in real terms over this spending review period. The people of Wales desperately need Labour to put an end to its political posturing and finally start acting in our nation's national interests. We need to hold Labour account for what they've been doing in Wales and make sure that it doesn't happen to the rest of the United Kingdom. We must contrast Labour's appalling record of failure with delivery by our Conservative government. This was a government which was elected to sort out Brexit, and we have delivered. This was a government that brought the UK through the worst health crisis in a century and rolled out the fastest vaccine in the world. And it was our Prime Minister as Chancellor who ensured the fastest and most generous furlough scheme in the world. More than 100 jobs were saved in Wales alone. Our government has stood up for democracy in Ukraine, so much so that the Ukrainian president has publicly thanked the Prime Minister and this government for the United Kingdom's leadership. And while Labour have failed Wales, the Conservative Party have been delivering. And Rishi Sunak Wales has so far received more than £200 million as part of our ambitious levelling up agenda. Wales received not one but two free ports which will generate thousands of local jobs for local people. And only today the Prime Minister announced that four places in Wrexham, Barry, Merthyr, Tidville and Cumbran, places which Labour have forgotten, will receive £20 million over 10 years to invest in local people's priorities. We've also recruited thousands of extra police officers to keep Welsh streets safe. And our bold plans for Wales do not stop there. Just this month, along with Kemi Badenoch, I was able to announce half a billion pounds is going to secure the future of steel in Port Talbot. It's a plan, ladies and gentlemen, that has saved thousands of jobs and means that steel will continue to be made in South Wales. This government has ensured that Welsh people's priorities are our priorities. And ladies and gentlemen, when the election comes, there'll be a simple choice to make. So we need to get out on the doorsteps and remind people what that choice is. It's a choice between a Labour Party already in power in Wales that would give us more taxes, fewer immigration rules, failing public services, and a war on motorists, or the choice of a Conservative government which will continue to deliver lower inflation, a growing economy, better public services, and stopping small boats. And on every doorstep, in every conversation, at every opportunity, let us make it clear that we understand that these are the real priorities, that we will deliver on them, and with Rishi Sunak in charge, we will win that historic fifth term in office. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Douglas Ross, leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Thank you, uh, Conference. It's fantastic to speak to this gathering of the Conservative and Unionist Party. We in this hall and members across the country are Unionists by definition. It's in our party's DNA. To be a Conservative is to be a Unionist. 
unlike our opponents, Conservatives don't apologise for being British, we embrace it. We celebrate our common history and heritage and look forward to that shared future Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland will continue to build together. Conference, I know that Rishi Sunak and this UK Conservative and Unionist Government are taking the long-term decisions to build a brighter future for Scotland and the whole of the United Kingdom. I was with our Prime Minister in Aberdeenshire in the summer when he announced over 100 new oil and gas licences in the North Sea and he gave the go-ahead to the new carbon capture cluster facility in Peterhead. These announcements will strengthen energy security for the whole of the UK but they will also secure tens of thousands of skilled Scottish jobs. Jobs that Labour and the SNP would put on the scrap heap as soon as possible to appease green extremists like Just Stop Oil. Well, the last thing that Scotland needs is the Miliband millstone around our neck. This Conservative and Unionist Party will never abandon North Sea workers like Keir Stammer would. We are now the only party you can trust to stand up for Scotland's oil. And these announcements are just one part of what the Conservatives are delivering for Scotland. From free ports to spaceports, roads to ferries, supercomputers to agricultural technology, we are investing in the projects that will drive growth across our whole country, secure and create Scottish jobs and Scottish businesses and strengthen the essential contribution Scotland makes to our United Kingdom. Well, Conference, it's been a pretty interesting year in Scottish politics. I have uh, more than a few things to update you on since we last met. In fact, I'm struggling to uh, know where to begin. Well, let's start here. Nicola Sturgeon is gone. Let me just repeat that. Nicola Sturgeon is gone. For years, we were told that she was unstoppable, that she could apparently do no wrong. How many times did the media proclaim that Scotland was on the cusp of independence under her leadership, or that she would wipe out the Scottish Tories? Well, I can proudly say that her career lies in tatters, and we conference are still here. It was our party, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, that was the constant thorn in her side. We stopped the SNP from winning a majority in election after election. We fought her dangerous gender reform bill, which, let's not forget conference, was backed at each stage by Labour. And we stood up to Nicola Sturgeon's plans for a second independence referendum every step of the way. Now, since she's left, the SNP have been having some difficulties. A police investigation into party finances, the luxury camper van seized, and Hamza Youssef as leader. The best the SNP now have to offer is a poor Nicola Sturgeon tribute act. But we can't be complacent. His government are already spending millions of taxpayers' money on promoting independence. And Hamza Youssef is treating next year's election as a proxy referendum. Nicola Sturgeon may have quit, but the SNP haven't gone away. They're down, but they're not out. They are just as dangerous to the future of our country than they have ever been. We still need to fight for every vote to win as many seats as possible because next year we can deliver a fatal blow for the campaign for independence. We can ensure the nationalists fall short again, and we can put Hamza and Yusuf's government on notice. And in so many seats, only the Scottish Conservatives can beat the SNP. Conference, this Conservative UK government delivers for Scotland. And on energy, financial services, food and drink, tourism, and so much more, Scotland delivers for the whole of the United Kingdom. If we remove the SNP, if we can kick them out of power in every part of our nation, 
Scotland can finally move on from the independence never ending, and together we can build a stronger, more prosperous United Kingdom. Now, to speak more about strengthening our country, let's welcome to the stage the man who puts Scotland at the heart of the UK Government, the scourge of SNP globetrotting, the bin man of the Greens recycling schemes, the defender of women's rights, my friend, your Scottish Secretary, Alistair Jack. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to thank, thank, I'd like to thank a few people. For, uh, firstly, obviously, Douglas, who gave a very kind in introduction, not just his kind introduction, but also his support at Westminster, and most importantly of all, his strong leadership of the Scottish Conservatives in Holyrood. Secondly, I'd like to thank my Scotland Office Ministers, Malcolm Offord and John Lamont, the ministerial team that's sitting here in front of at the front of the uh, auditorium, and they do excellent work in Scotland. I want to thank them for everything they do. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <clears throat> Conference, I'm here with a very clear message today. The United Kingdom has never been stronger, and that is not by accident. Yes, it's true, the nationalists are doing everything they can to strengthen the union for us. They have shredded whatever credibility they once had, but I'm not going to comment on a live police investigation. However, I think we can all agree that the people of Scotland have been shocked by the investigation into the SNP's finances. The arrests of leading SNP figures, the searches, the blue and white evidence tents in the garden, the camper van. So it's no surprise that people in Scotland have quite rightly become very angry at the abject failure of the Scottish Government to deliver on the things that matter most to them. They are sick and tired of record NHS waiting times, of poor standards in our schools, and then, of course, there's the ferries, or the lack of them. The SNP and their Green Coalition masters are dragging Scotland down more and more every day, and people have come to the obvious conclusion if the nationalists can't even organise a bottle deposit return scheme properly, all their talk of removing Scotland from the United Kingdom is pure fantasy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the SNP are increasingly looking like a busted flush, but that's not the only reason why the United Kingdom is stronger than ever. The Union is stronger than ever thanks to this government the most active and effective UK government in Scotland in the devolution era. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud of that because we have a great story to tell. We have delivered record funding for the Scottish Government, so they really have no excuses for their poor performance in areas such as health and education. We have supported families across Scotland facing cost of living pressures. We have pledged to halve inflation, to get the economy growing, creating better jobs and to bring down the national debt. And we're reaching out across the world to maximise the benefits of Brexit, striking trade deals worth billions of pounds to our distillers, our salmon producers and our defence industry. And we're not just seeing the benefits of Brexit for the UK with trade deals either. The Chancellor has introduced new financial service regulations. We're backing our fishing industry. Now it's out of the hated common fisheries policy and we've passed legislation allowing our farmers to use cutting-edge gene-editing technology. Cutting-edge technology that has been pioneered in Scotland, but which is sadly banned in Scotland by the SNP, government, SNP Green Government at Holyrood, despite the wishes of our farmers and the NFU Scotland. As Secretary of State, I've also been clear that we will use our post-Brexit internal market legislation to protect Scotland's free-flowing trade across the whole of the United Kingdom because 60% of our trade is with the rest of the UK, and I will not allow the nationalists to create unnecessary obstacles. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that we're also supporting our globally successful oil and gas industry. This government is clear. We should continue to use our own North Sea resources as we move to net zero. 
our own resources as we bring down prices and improve our energy security. Both Labour and the SNP are threatening to shut down your oil and ga gas industry prematurely, and I believe that is sheer madness. It cannot be in Scotland or the United Kingdom's best interests. We must support our oil and gas industry just as we support renewables as we will transition to a much better future. And at a time of war in Europe and wider global uncertainty, we've also backed our amazing armed forces to the hilt, so much, so, so much of which is based in Scotland. So perhaps now is a very good moment for me to pay tribute to my friend and fellow Scot, Ben Wallace, an outstanding Defence Secretary who has served this party, this government and our country with great distinction. Ladies and gentlemen, there is more. This government is going further than any previous government of the devolution era in delivering for Scotland. As Secretary of State for Scotland, it has been my privilege and passion to drive forward direct UK government investment in Scotland. It is now worth £2.5 billion, and that is over and above the Scottish Government's record funding settlement. I was absolutely delighted with the announcement today that seven towns in Scotland will receive around £20 million each as part of our long-term plan for towns. It is the latest in a long line of levelling up initiatives reaching every corner of the country. It is creating jobs, transforming communities, delivering high-profile projects that people really care about. We are backing small-scale grassroots initiatives, high-profile arts projects, cutting-edge research in universities, and much, much more. We've also led the way creating free ports based around the Firth of Forth and the Cromarty Firth. The Prime Minister and I visited the Cromarty Firth where the news was announced, and I know that he, as a long-term champion of free ports, is as excited as I am about the impact this will have on the Highland economy. We're following up that by creating investment zones in Aberdeen and Glasgow. And ladies and gentlemen, we recognised some time ago we had to change the damaging old philosophy of devolve and forget, leaving too much in the hands of the devolved administration in Holyrood and allowing the role of the UK government to fade into the background. Well, today, I can announce the era of devolve and forget is well and truly over. It is dead, it is finished, and I promise you, it is not coming back under my watch. <laughs> On scores of projects, we are now working directly with local councils and other responsible delivery partners, and I call that real devolution. No longer can the failing SNP Green Administration hoard decision-making powers and resources in Holyrood, using it for their own political purposes rather than the priorities of most people in Scotland. And my view of devolution is straightforward. It is about Scotland's two governments at Westminster and Holyrood respecting each other's roles and working together where we can. We know that is how devolution works best, and we know it is what the vast majority of Scots want and what they expect. But unfortunately, my view is not shared by the Nationalists. Time again, time and time again, they have sought to undermine the devolution settlement in order to provoke unnecessary disagreement between the two governments. When they took Nicola Sturgeon's referendum bill to the Supreme Court, they wasted taxpayers' money confirming what everyone already knew. The Constitution and the Union are matters reserved to Westminster. When they tried to introduce a new system of self-ID for trans people, their Gender Recognition Reform Bill, they ignored the harmful impact on safeguards for women and girls in existing reserved legislation. And when they tried to bring a bottled deposit return scheme, they failed to consider the impact of cross-border trade. In each case, I felt it was my duty as Secretary of State for Scotland to step in. And I will not stand by and I will not allow nationalist ministers to undermine or abuse the devolution settlement for their own political purposes, not now, not ever. Sadly, I'm not surprised by the nationalist approach. They do not support devolution, so why would they respect it? But what concerns me are the consequences, the waste of time, money and resources that should be fo focused on people's real priorities in Scotland. Struggling businesses left out of pocket by the, the collapse of that shambolic bottled deposit return scheme. 
the anxiety felt by so many women at the potential erosion of safeguards afforded by the Equality Act. The Scottish Government need to understand their political game playing causes real damage. And as Douglas Ross said so forcefully earlier this afternoon, they need to drop their narrow obsession with breaking up Britain and do the job they were elected to do. They need to respect devolution. They need to take that record budget they receive from the Treasury and they, use it, they must use it to deliver public services that Scots can rely on. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we know this union, this great enduring partnership between Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland creates opportunity and drives success for us all. Quite simply, we achieve more together and that is why I'm so proud to play my part in a UK government that has done more than any other to strengthen this United Kingdom. And we're doing it daily, right across Scotland, investing directly in projects that create jobs and level up communities. We're doing it by supporting our key industries, by protecting cross-border trade and boosting the economy. And we're doing it, we're doing it by defending devolution robustly against the nationalist attempts to bend it and twist it for their own narrow political purposes. There could not be a clearer contrast between a nationalist SNP Scottish Government that is in chaos, that is failing, that is letting people down by putting their obsession with leaving the United Kingdom above everything else it does. And this United Kingdom Government, under the outstanding leadership of Rishi Sunak, that is 100% focused on the issues that really matter most to the people in Scotland and across the whole United Kingdom, more and more people in Scotland are seeing the benefits of having a United Kingdom that is energetically and visibly on their side because that is what people want. It's what's best for Scotland and it's what we will continue to deliver. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Secretary of State for Defence, Grant Shapps. When people think of the Blitz, they tend to think of London, the burning Docklands and St Paul's shrouded in smoke. But Manchester endured its own Blitz early on in 1940, where some 680 people were killed. Fortunately for our country, that kind of systematic destruction on this scale is a thing of memory. But imagine if a trip to the market or restaurant could be your last, that you or those that you love might fall victim to a sudden attack by a cruise missile or a suicide drone plunging through the sky. This is daily life in Ukraine on freedom's front line. Even as the fighting falls deep into its second year, it's still hard to believe that full-scale war is raging here in Europe. And Ukraine isn't some long-away distant country of which we know nothing. It's part of the family of European democratic nations. And they are fighting for the very survival. Fighting for freedom against an invader as ruthless as any in modern times. A tyrant who sees civilians as collateral damage in a failed war of conquest he cannot win, but he also cannot find a way to exit either. Putin hoped to take Ukraine by bluff. A swift armoured invasion designed to seize Kyiv and install a puppet government. Ukraine would be taken quickly. It would be overwhelmed. It would be reduced to a vassal state, its identity and freedom crushed. But the Ukrainian people were not going to let that happen. And neither were we. The United Kingdom stepped up. <laughs> we have provided billions in military aid, second only to the contribution of the United States. We have consistently been the first in responding to Ukraine's needs. The Enlaw anti-tank missiles, wisely sent in advance by Britain, thank you to Ben Wallace, 
were crucial in those first early weeks when the fate of Ukraine hang, hung in the balance. And as end laws struck fear into the hearts of invading Russian tank crews at the beginning, so our long-range long cruise missiles do the same for Russian commanders today. With weapons like Storm Shadow, everywhere in Russian-occupied Ukraine is on the front line. And we cannot, we must not, let up now. The war is consuming weapons and ammunition, and yes, people, at an appalling rate. If Ukrainians are to prevail against the evil assault on their homeland, we must remain steadfast. And that's why we're helping to train their F-16 pilots. It's why by the end of this year, we'll have trained more than 50,000 Ukrainian recruits, starting well in advance of the war. And of course, it's why Ukrainians have been welcomed by so many British families under the Homes for Ukraine scheme, including for a year in my own home. Now, my wife and I were partly moved to act because our own ancestors fled to this country to escape the pogroms of Eastern Europe in an earlier age. But what really moved us most was the palpable sense of generosity from the British public for our new arrivals to Britain. Complete strangers came forward with clothes, with school books for six-year-old Nikita, and most precious of all, their time to help ensure the three-generation Ukrainian family that came to live with us felt truly at home in the United Kingdom. You know, we should never be complacent about this country. Whatever our grumbles, this is a precious and incredibly generous land. <laughs> On my first visit to Ukraine this summer, I visited Nikita's nursery in Kiev. I saw the apartment block across the road from his kindergarten that had been destroyed by one of Putin's rockets at the start of the war. This was the attack that made Nikita, his mother, his grandmother, together with their dog Max, flee from Ukraine. Only as I glanced across the street from his nursery this summer, there was no bombed out shell to view. The apartment block had already been completely rebuilt, re-inhabited. What I was witnessing was the iron resolve of the Ukrainian people, ordinary people, maintaining a semblance of life even amongst the air raid sirens, rebuilding their homes the moment they get the chance. And last week, as Defence Secretary, I visited Kyiv again. And this time, I met with the steely resolve of President Zelensky himself. At a time when he could have left the capital. At a time when he could have become a leader in exile, he did not. He stayed put and he provided inspiration for his people and he showed remarkable bravery. <laughs> Ukraine has taught us a lesson. The war reminds us of the unprovoked aggression by one nation against another is still a reality in global affairs. Left unchecked, we are all in danger. And this is why we must invest in our defence. That's why, under the Conservative government, defence spending has exceeded £50 billion a year for the first time ever. And conference? It's why we'll maintain our leading position in NATO by increasing defence budget to 2.5% of GDP when conditions allow. Because we know the world is changing. So, as a result, we're working ever closer with our allies. Developing the latest naval technology to protect our Commonwealth kith and kin in the Pacific as they face the challenge of a rapidly expanding Chinese Navy. Deploying the two of the world's largest and most advanced carriers in history the Royal Navy has ever seen in the Queen Elizabeth, HMS, and HMS Princess, Prince of Wales. 
We're plowing billions into our own naval shipbuilding program, as well as into civilian construction to create jobs and to grow our economy. And Britain is one of the few nations capable of operating in every ocean in the world simultaneously. Our ultimate national insurance policy is, of course, our at-sea nuclear deterrent. So we're building the new Dreadnought-class submarines that will carry Britain's nuclear deterrent into the middle of this century. And today, I can announce that we've signed contracts worth £4 billion with leading British businesses to drive forward the development of the most powerful attack submarines ever operated by the Royal Navy. These hunter-killer orca submarines will empower the Royal Navy to maintain our strategic advantage under the sea, enabling us to compete with emerging navies uh, anywhere in the world as our world becomes more unpredictable and dangerous. Today's announcement will support thousands of jobs from Barrow and Furness, where these submarines will be built, to Derby, where our reactor build facilities will be expanded. And by backing British businesses to develop them, we're taking the long-term decisions we need to boost our defence industry and to grow our economy. Under our Prime Minister's leadership, the Conservatives are putting UK at the very heart of NATO. Vladimir Putin shattered peace across Europe, but in doing so, he made our collective will and our resolve more important than ever. And in response, the UK is taking a leading role in ensuring that NATO remains the bedrock of our security for us and for our allies. We are one of NATO's very few members exceeding the critical 2% of GDP target for the amount of money which is spent on our defence. And, of course, we are the largest defence spender in Europe, and we're delivering capabilities our alliance needs. Today, I can announce the UK has stepped up again with two new deployments. First, in response to a request from our Polish friends, RAF Typhoons are landing in Poland as I speak to support our NATO ally with the growing threat of Russian interference. Deploying ahead of Poland's elections, there'll be a very powerful way of, undeni of undeniably showing Putin that this Conservative government will de to protect democracy and freedom from any despotic tyrant that threatens our allies. <laughs> and second, ahead of what I think has been a concerning week, or at the end of what I think has been a concerning week, there has been a request from NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Europe and so I have authorised the full deployment of a battalion-sized UK strategic reserve force to NATO's Kosovo peacekeeping mission. In the days ahead, hundreds of soldiers from the 1st Battalion, Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, will join the 400 British service men and women already in Kosovo. And as the best of the best, I know our soldiers will do the United Kingdom proud. We've been unwavering in our support for NATO, contributing to every allied mission that they have and supporting them this weekend, so that when NATO contacted us, they knew the answer from the United Kingdom would be yes. As Conservatives, we put national security first, which is more than can be said for Labour. So, what is Keir Starmer's approach to our fundamental security? Simple. He personally campaigned to make one Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister, the man who called for NATO to be disbanded. Starmer actually backed plans for Britain to adopt a non-nuclear, non-aligned defence policy. In plain English, that meant scrapping Trident, abandoning NATO, and leaving us naked in the face of nuclear threat from the Kremlin. And that isn't 
just the stammer of the past. Since then, he's gone further, appointing a shadow foreign secretary who has repeatedly voted against renewing our nuclear deterrent. You know, in the military sphere, it's sometimes good to keep your enemy guessing. The problem with Keir Starmer is that on policy, he keeps everyone guessing, including himself. What would Britain's armed forces look like after five years of labour? Who knows? The man will say anything, anything to get himself elected. But the one thing we do know is that you just cannot trust Labour on defence. And if, if, perish the thought, Labour get back into power, the old habits will resurface. Defence, always dismissed and disparaged by the left, will be the first casualty. Our service people and defence industries and our veterans all deserve much better conference. We must not let that happen. But there is one area in which we absolutely must do better. Service life is tough enough on families, servicemen and women, without having to put up with sub, sub, substandard accommodation. There are too many old and creaking buildings uh, in our estate, and that lowers morale. Our accommodation estate is, in fact, very large. Indeed, if the Ministry of Defence was a housing association, it would rank amongst the biggest in the land. So I'm making it a personal priority to improve its quality which is why we're, in, we're injecting £400 million to ensure that we provide the modern accommodation that our service families deserve. And while resolving this problem will not be instantaneous, I am determined that we fix it in order to support our brave men and women at home as well as on the front line. And while we're on the subject of morale, I want to end by saying something about our party. One of the things I most admire about the military is that they don't gloss over the harsh realities. Now, times are tough. We are behind in the polls. The pundits tell us that Labour is a shoe in And we wouldn't be human if we didn't sometimes feel the pressure. But for those who think that this conference is going to be nothing more than inward-looking or downcast, I say this. This country faces an important choice. Rishi Sunak will make the hard but necessary long-term decisions to get the country on the right path for the future. Or Sir Keir Starmer, a man focused on the short term, lacking the backbone to make the big changes that Britain needs. If Rishi, in Rishi, we have a leader who's weathered a very brutal baptism of fire and is coming through. His mettle has been tested and not found wanting. He stuck to his course, trusting in what he believes to be right for the country. It doesn't always make him popular in the short term, but that is the price of doing the right thing. We need leadership that puts the national interest over self-interest and does what is right, not what is easy. Now I trust British people, their good sense, and they can spot a serious man to take the tough decisions. And they can spot an opposition leader who's made an art out of political opportunism. So let's take the fight to say anything Starmer. He's measuring the curtains. He thinks he's home and dry. He thinks that he can take Downing Street by bluff. But as the steely Sir Claude Organlech said before the first battle of El Alamein, when the British had their backs to the wall and Rommel seemed triumphant, Let's show him where he gets off. Thank you.
Britain is back. Labour want you to think that we're a small country with no influence on the world stage. Our country's reputation for the rule of law has been badly damaged. They have never been so wrong. We truly appreciate and value our close relationship with the United Kingdom. As always, we simply could not ask for a better partner than the United Kingdom. We're not held back by the past. We don't want to go back to the constraints of a single bureaucratic bloc. Our vision for this country is forward-looking, optimistic, global. And we can be proud that the Conservatives are working and winning for the British people all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverley. It, uh, it's been a year since I was appointed, and uh, I've been, in that time, to over 60 international visits. I have hosted over 100 inward visits. I have had over 700 meetings or calls with foreign representatives. I've also had the honour of accompanying His Majesty the King on two state visits. And my ministerial team, I know, have worked just as hard. And so if you're wondering where they are at the moment during this speech, they're out in the wider world promoting Britain on the world stage. And all those visits, all those meetings, all those calls has allowed me to hear firsthand what the world thinks of us. And as a result, my view of Britain's standing in the world has never been clearer. People want to see us. People care about what we say. People admire what we stand for. But perhaps most importantly, people respect what we do. Far from being left on the sidelines, we remain right at the heart of things. And we should all be immensely proud of our country's standing on the world stage. And let me explain why. And let me explain to the people who think that Brexit has hindered us. Let me spell it out to the people who think our best years are behind us. And let me make it clear to those on the Labour benches who want to play politics and put our country down. This government with Rishi Sunak at the helm, takes decisive measures and is prepared to take the tough, long-term decisions for the benefit of our country. And so, of course, we send emergency rescue teams to Morocco and to Turkey and Syria in response to those terrible earthquakes. And, of course, we evacuate those British nationals caught up in the Sudan conflict. But we also sign free trade agreements with countries around the globe. We lead by example in our unrelenting support for Ukraine and we call out Russia for its heinous crimes. And we sanction the brutal Iranian judges who target the brave women of that country who are campaigning for nothing more than their freedoms. We have consistently helped the worst off in the world lift themselves out of poverty. We have consistently fought injustice wherever we see it. And we have consistently led the way in times of international crisis. But some people ask me when they talk to me, they say, James, that's all well and good, that's great. But what does foreign affairs matter to the British people? How does it help the people of Braintree or Belfast, or Bankery, or Bridge End. Well, it helps because when we engage with our allies, old or new, we become safer and we become more prosperous. The PM gets it. Our party gets it. You get it. Keir Starmer and his crowd 
don't get it. And over the last few years, of course, we have seen incredibly tough global circumstances. A global pandemic. And as my uh, good friend Grant has just said, we are now confronted with a brutal war on our own continent. But this Prime Minister was prepared to take the tough, long-term decisions that we needed. And we have thrived, despite the incredibly strong economic headwinds, powered by the pandemic and intensified and amplified by the war in Ukraine. And because of his long-term decisions, our economy is back to pre-pandemic levels. And Britain has recovered quicker from that pandemic than Europe's biggest economies. Under this Prime Minister, we have made immense progress in very little time. And unlike Starmer, sorry, under Starmer, rather, Labour are all talk. Under Sunak, we are about action. As I say, in the uh, relatively short time that Rishi has been Prime Minister, let, ha let us look at what we have achieved. We agreed the Windsor Framework in February. We agreed the AUKUS deal in March. The Horish uh, Hiroshima Accord in May. And the Atlantic Declaration in June. We've come to agreements with Europe that will help grow our economy help stop the boats and make us all safer. Conference, we should be incredibly proud of our country and incredibly proud of what we achieved in just this short period of time. And the Prime Minister's leadership has allowed us to take full advantage of the bold decision that we collectively made in 2016. So let me give you a few facts and figures just to prove the point. Last year, service exports reached a record high. Exports of goods and services grew by 20% in current prices and are likely to increase again this year. And we remain the second largest service exporter in the world, behind only the United States of America, which, I may remind you, has five times as many people as us. And today, nearly 60% of UK exports go to non-EU countries. And that is up from 52% in 2010. And the long-term economic trend is clear. And it's one that we expect not just to continue, but to intensify. And that's why because we are looking at the future, because we are facing forward, we recently concluded negotiations to join the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Easier to say than you, than you might believe. And actually, it took me longer to say it than it took for us to join it. That's because we are focused on building our friendships, our forces and our relationships with the Indo-Pacific region. It's why we are pushing so hard to conclude a trade deal with India, an economy forecast to double in size by 2030, overtaking both Japan and Germany to become the world's third largest economy. And it's markets like these that are the future. And we recognize their value to us will grow enormously. And again, whilst we have a global outlook, labor can hardly imagine the world beyond Brussels. Now, the world has got used to engaging with a new independent Britain, to engaging with a Britain that is free to forge its own destiny, 
free to ratify its own laws and free to negotiate its own trade deals. And our newfound independence has enabled us to repeatedly get ahead of events, whether that's with the manufacturing of life-saving vaccines, which then gave us the ability to lift out of lockdowns, or whether it's the sanctioning of the Russians involved in the illegal, brutal and disgusting conduct, both domestically and abroad. And yes, I'm especially proud of our record when it comes to the support of the people of Ukraine. We foresaw the extent and the intensity of the price of the fight that President Zelensky and his brave people faced in February of 2022. And I consider it a personal privilege to have done what I can to maximise international support for that courageous country. But never let anyone forget that for almost a decade now, every Conservative Prime Minister has backed Ukraine. From training Ukrainian troops after the initial invasion of Crimea 2014, to standing up to Putin over the poisonings in Salisbury, from arming Ukrainians with the Enlor missile systems when Russia first initiated their full-scale invasion, to sanctioning Putin and his cronies who have facilitated the brutalizing of the Ukrainian people. And let's remember that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak continued in this proud tradition with his unwavering support. He was the first world leader to supply Ukraine with NATO standard main battle tanks. He was the first world leader to commit to training fast jet pilots. He was the first world leader to supply the long-range missiles that support those brave Ukrainians fighting in the front line. And earlier this year, Rishi Sunak hosted the landmark Ukraine Recovery Conference in London, where we secured billions of dollars in international funding so that Ukraine will be able to rebuild itself once they win this war. <laughs> Whilst I occupy this great office, I've considered the many challenges that we face as a nation. And I've contemplated the ways of making my department more effective at tackling those obstacles. For example, when it comes to stopping the boats, we have and will continue to coordinate and cooperate not just across government, but with our international allies as well. We have collaborated closely with the governments of the countries where these inhumane people smuggling gangs are based. But I recognise that we need to keep going. And so today, I've written to all of our ambassadors, all of our high commissioners, and I've instructed each and every one of them to do even more work with the countries in which they represent the UK to help stop the abhorrent trafficking of human lives across the English Channel. Be in no doubt, no doubt at all, our diplomats will redouble their effort to bring an end to this terrible, terrible injustice. Now, I'm incredibly proud of the diplomats that I work alongside. I have no doubt that they are the best in the world. But I want to ensure that our diplomatic service is truly representative of the UK. And unsurprisingly, I believe that those who have served our nation on the battlefield can continue to contribute beyond their tours of duty. Which is why I have tasked my officials 
to carve out space in our diplomatic service for veterans. And I look forward to working with Johnny Mercer, our veterans minister, to ensure that uh, the men and women from our armed forces, who we know are amongst the best of us, to give them the opportunity to be the best at representing the UK. And you will forgive me, but it does make me immensely proud to offer those who have served our country with unparalleled distinction the opportunity to serve their nation once again. Speaking of service and pride, you will know that I served as chairman of this great party during 2019. And I remember the uh, doomsters and the gloomsters who predicted another hung parliament. They predicted an outright conservative loss, or at best, modest conservative gains. And those were the people whose amazing predictions predated the most significant electoral victory of recent times and an 80-seat Conservative majority. And yet, today, I see the same old faces, the same voices, the same old politicians making the same old tired predictions. And when I look across the floor at the House of Commons, I see a group of spineless ditherers, devoid of answers to any of the challenges the world faces or that our country faces. And yet, they're there, baying with disapproval at the tough but necessary decisions that our government has to make. And where, I ask myself, is the leadership from their so-called leader? Because Sakir can't make up his mind whether he supports leaving the EU or whether he uh, supports remaining in the EU or rejoining the EU. He pledged to cut tuition fees in order to get elected as Labour leader and then went back on his promise as soon as he became Labour leader. He resigned from Corbyn's cabinet, then he rejoined Corbyn's cabinet, then he campaigned to make Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister. What we see is no clarity, no consistency, no policies, no plan, only the same old tired opportunistic politics. Keir Starmer's Labour Party doesn't stand for anything. And whilst Sir Keir and his comrades represent the tired politics of the past, the Prime Minister is ready to do things differently. And why? Because the Conservative Party believes in Britain's epic potential. And the Labour Party is unwilling to take the tough decisions that will ensure the prosperity and the safety of this country for generations to come. Conference, I can think of nothing more counterproductive than handing over the keys of government to a group of political chances and visionless ideologues. It is a scenario I refuse to entertain. Because a party that does not believe in Britain cannot be trusted to lead it. Only the Conservatives have a plan for the future. Only Conservatives will take the tough decisions that will keep us safe and keep us prosperous. Only the Conservatives will stand with pride on the world stage. The people of this great country will see that, and that is why they will vote for Rishi and the Conservatives at the next election. Thank you. Thank you very much.